The current skill base of CSPs is not necessarily what they need for their evolution into DSPs. So how can they recruit the necessary new employees whilst competing against the glamour of the hyperscale cloud and content providers as well as a potentially lucrative startup culture? Certainly it's, it's about career development really but in terms of um, apprenticeships that really is the perfect way to fill the skills gap especially with the introduction of the apprenticeship levy for large organisations but I think giving people the opportunity, re-upskilling your existing workforce as well to be able to, with the new standards being brought in um, and they're being devised, then that is for the future. And I think that it's about retaining the staff that you've got, reskilling them and then hiring new where you can um, apprenticeships for, for the future talent. We do have a strategy that we are recruiting for future jobs. So when we're looking at those mainly young people, it doesn't have to be, but people who want to come for an apprenticeship, it's like, not just what do we need now, but what do we need in the future? So a digital technologies degree might take four years. So we are looking, have we got a position for someone with that sort of degree in four years' time? So there is some forward thinking there. One of the reasons that we set up our scheme in 2013 is because unless you were the big guys like BT, Virgin Media, you couldn't get an apprentice because it was so admin heavy the burden of it so that's why we set it up in 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 2013 so we've now recruited over 100 apprentices for the sme industry and that's just continuing to grow and that's what i think is great about apprenticeships because actually you're giving people experience on hands experience giving them the ability to learn they can earn while they're doing it and it's written by the industry which is what the industry wants that person to be able to do we're also looking at removing the stem requirements so currently for a level four a degree a lot of providers will ask them to have a STEM A-level and that itself can be quite prohibitive both in terms of diversity and also in social mobility. So we're removing that and seeing how if they come to us and they haven't got that STEM, what can we do to train them? And we're not the only people doing that. I think a lot of colleagues in other organisations are trying to do that. So I think there is um, creativity out there. People are trying to think how we can use this and I think apprenticeships do give that opportunity with the Roots to Work training. At the undergrad level, I mean, if you look at the, 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 the syllabus and the curriculum that are being followed, generally speaking, and I can certainly vouch for it at UCL, the answer is the right subjects are there. All the things like digital technology, basic network uh, functionality, analog as well as digital, um, all those subjects are there if you look carefully. Um, I think what's happening more recently is that those have been augmented now because of all the transition that we've been talking about. Those subjects, which are the, the basic things you have to know, um, are, are being added to with things like understanding um, the, uh, the commercial aspects, the business, fit, the, the, the business framework. We see in the United States that the University of Colorado has got a, a very, very successful program. They, they claim to have the largest uh, SDN lab for students in, in, in North America. And uh, their, their graduates just get snapped up before they, they've completed their, their undergrad uh, courses and going to places like Facebook mm -hmm. and Google, as well as, um, as well as the telcos. So they've really got that working very well. Um, our interaction with educational institutions, apart from the University of Colorado, has been a little bit challenged. And a lot of them are way down, well, way down. I don't mean that in a derogatory way, but they're down at the protocol level or they're doing a lot of uh, research around uh, analytics, but they're not up where the transformation to, DS, you know, to the DSP is going on. So yeah, they'd like to help, but um, this isn't going to go into their curriculum because that's not what's going to drive funding. A lot of universities are just driven by where they can get the funding for their research. Um, and uh, naturally, that will distort, distort the picture. So I, I think you've raised a, a very valid point that there often is this sort of mismatch. I, I, I will give an example of Japan where we were told by um, one of our members, it's actually the Okinawa Open Lab, um, they work a lot in Japan with the service providers, the vendors, but they've identified a shortage of 200,000 qualified, skilled people for the telecoms industry in Japan already, and that's growing. And so there's a government initiative to bring the universities and the educational institutions and the labs and the vendors and the service providers together 
and they have a structured program for upgrading the curricula in real time. I sat in with the Philip Auger review. It was actually at number 10, which was very nice. And there was a guy who was the head of a massive um, CSP in this country. He said, I could go to China tomorrow. In fact, he said, I have been to China. I had 10 people to interview. <clears throat> Half of them were women, which is a whole other issue we haven't talked about just sure. yet, which is the gender diversity within our, our world. Half of them, it might have even been six out of the ten were women. Not only had they studied at university exactly what I wanted them to do, they also spoke several languages. He said, I couldn't walk in, I couldn't get one person to do that in this country. Mm -hmm. So he was, you know, really just making the point there is a lag in who we're attracting, what we're teaching and what we're getting at the other end compared to what we actually need. I think that we have to think at perhaps a slightly higher level. And just like the SDOs are being asked to reinvent themselves and become more agile because the needs have changed, um, perhaps the educational environment also needs to adjust and become more agile. And perhaps the, the example that you were giving is that it's actually, what do I need to learn now I'm going to learn it now because that's what's needed and I'm not going to do everything that's wonderful and important to know. I'm quite sympathetic to the idea, but uh, it, it's a tricky one to manage. Um, what I will say is that um, there is a need for a very close linkage between what the universities are teaching and the industry. So if we are doing that and I know many other universities do the same thing. So it's going towards the direction you suggest while still having an academic framework. We've been talking about the next generation of employees, so it's about time we, we heard from them. Um, Regan Turner and Josh Fowler, give an applause for these two um, young people, please. <laughs> Regan, you're a BSc undergraduate student at the University of Salford, and, and, and Josh, you're Senior Technical Service Centre Technician at CenturyLink as part of their apprenticeship. I guess what's was probably the most important thing is I've been studying the theory of telecommunications for the last four years, but to actually come here, kind of see the challenges that's in the industry, kind of see the opportunities that are coming up here, it's kind of shot me really what's going on in the industry right now. It's a, I found it quite overwhelming really. Even where I work, I'm the only person below the age of 30 um, in, in my department. Um, and, and when you look at something like that, that's quite scary. Um, what happens when all those people retire? There's me left. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do everyone's job. Um, and yeah, it, it, it's. Uh, and I think, like you say, the environment of, of having those um, old school technicians uh, as they were, um, sometimes their thinking isn't correct, um, not in the sense of what they're doing at the job, but the way they've been in the industry for years and years and years. It, it, it's they're there to fill a position, get their money, go home. There is no ambition. Um, so how, how do you create that ambition and, and how do you keep something alive? And, and that's where Google come in and that's what they've been able to do. Mm. They've, they've been able to um, sort of create this culture where anything's possible. Um, and and uh, I think that comes down to the values of companies. You know, what, 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 what your core values of the company, how, how do they fit in with your employees and how can you uh, structure your core values around apprentices and the younger generation coming up. What do they look for in a company? What, what are their values and how can you adapt that to them? What we all need to do is just open our uh, hearts, our companies, our working practices to say whether it be apprentices or uh, industry placements or graduate schemes and I'm sure somebody has already clocked Reagan as a potential if, he's, if you don't get any, at least three interviews by the end of today, <laughs> you know these, and they are fantastic. You bring them in, you give them the opportunity, you make them feel yep. loved and welcomed and looked after. They will work really hard. Our retention for apprentices is at over eighty-five percent five years after they finish their program with us. That's mm. huge. I've studied the theory now. I want somebody to take me in um, and just develop me really in a career. I'm quite fortunate. Uh, I've already secured in with BT Global Services on their grad scheme. Gosh. It's conditional of a 2-1, but hopefully, fingers crossed. Um, but just somebody to really just develop me <laughs> and, and build me a, a, a lifelong career, really.